Of course, if you're the Federals, you're going to expect someone to pay their taxes. If you're Federals, you can expect someone to pay their taxes. They could try to pay taxes to both sides, but then you take side both sides up. I mean, it's a very complicated situation here. But based on this voting, the ultimate overwhelming sentiment of the people in Missouri is to just leave us be. If the North and the South are going to fight, leave us out of it. And what happens in 1860-61 is in Missouri, they, begin, they hold a secession convention like all the other states. And essentially what happens is they have a convention. This individual up here, Sterling Price, is the presides over it. And in the convention, they vote to do nothing. Neither embrace the union and support the union, or, although they're still technically in the union, or to join the Confederacy. And it breaks up. And this is a triumph for the policy of William Harney, who was the military commander in St. Louis at the time. Who you imagine is watching this situation pretty closely because there is a major arsenal in St. Louis and is as vulnerable as Fort Sumter is in South Carolina. Now, for the people of St. Louis, the arsenal is the Fort Sumter for them, what Fort Sumter is for, for, for uh, Charleston. And Harney's policy is simply to stay out of it, not do anything provocative, and let the, pro let the apathetic majority figure out that they want to stay apathetic. And that is satisfactory for, um, for Harney. However, there's an old saying, revolutions and great events are not driven by apathetic, apathetic majorities. They're driven by determined majority, minorities who sees opportunities, and you have some determined minorities in Missouri. They're led by Francis P. Blair, who is a congressman from St. Louis, and he finds a supporter and a young army captain by the name of Nathaniel Lyon. And for them, for Missouri simply to say, we want to stay out of it, is unsatisfactory. What they demand is that Missouri submit to the authority of the Union, unconditionally. And they get really, really nervous when, when Lincoln calls for troops, the governor of Missouri refuses to comply with their request. And that is Governor uh, Claiborne Fox Jackson, who's up there in the upper right-hand corner. Fox Jackson refuses to contribute troops to the effort and writes a very belligerent letter to, to Lincoln, making clear that he does not believe in this at all. Now, to Blair and Lyon, the state authorities are supposed to submit. This is unsatisfactory. So they maneuver to get Harney removed from power. And then they call together Claiborne Fox Jackson, who has begun raising troops, the Missouri State Guard, under the command of Sterling Price for the purpose of defending Missouri. Of course, the question is defending Missouri against who? And for Lyon and Blair, if Missouri is not raising troops for the federal government, but they're raising troops for another purpose, that is clearly unsatisfactory. Okay, they're raising the militia for some reason. So what they do is they seize and capture a camp called Camp Jackson in which the Missouri State Guard is assembling. They lead their captives through the, uh, city, the streets of St. Louis, and there is a riot in the streets of St. Louis. And things get very, very tense. Uh, there's an effort to calm things down. Uh, but eventually, in June, Lyon, Blair are going to meet with Price and Jackson in a place called the Planter's House in St. Louis. And Lyon is going to make clear, we will accept nothing less than complete submission to the authority of the federal government by you guys. And if not, he says, this means war. He says, before I will allow a state to dictate to the federal government what it can and cannot do, I would see every single man, woman in the state of Missouri dead. And Price and Jackson realize that this is not a man they can negotiate with. They go to Jefferson City, the capital. They try to raise some more troops. They do raise some more troops. But then Lyon and Blair, Lyon under the command, Lyon who's been promoted just from a captain to brigadier general, puts his troops, which he has raised principally from the German population of St. Louis. Now, if you study Missouri at the time, traditional leadership of Missouri rested with um, 
settlers who came in from Kentucky and Virginia and were largely agricultural and settled around the rivers of Missouri. Uh, but during the 1840s and 1850s, this new minority group, the Germans coming over from Germany, begin settling in St. Louis. They are more industrial, more commercial in their outlook, and they live in St. Louis. And to traditional Missourians, these Germans, this new tribe being introduced into their, well, that was probably, well, no, tribe maybe wasn't the right word, but, you know, like I said. Uh, this new, these people are viewed as a hostile outside threat to the traditional ideas and ways things are done in Missouri. And when Lyon begin, can't get troops raised from the traditional Missourians, he goes to these Germans. And with them, under his command, he marches on Jefferson City, chases the state government out, defeats the state militia in a battle called Boonville in mid-June, and essentially, a guy who a few weeks earlier was a captain in the United States Army has made the decision, largely on his own initiative, to overthrow a state government. I don't know how much authority captains in the Army have today, but I suspect this was a bit of an overstretch, okay? But he does this, and it appears to be successful on the surface because the state government of Missouri is chased pretty much almost all out of the state. They maintain a small foothold in the southwestern section of the state, but the federal government then installs a provisional governor by the name of Hamilton Gamble, and Missouri is back in the Union. Problem solved. Of course, as anybody who studied Missouri in the Civil War knows, the problem is not solved because what the people of Missouri start to do is they start picking up weapons and they start waging guerrilla war against the Union authorities there, making clear that military victory has not achieved that consent of the governed victory and that the war is going to be in Missouri is going to be a miserable, miserable affair. But on the surface, it appears to have worked out well. The idea that through a conventional victory, you can achieve the political results, you can influence the governed, win them back, appears to have been proven to work here in Missouri. And so, naturally, this provides encouragement to those in Virginia who believe the exact same thing should be done. Go out and fight a battle, defeat the enemy in a battle, and after you've done that, restore a loyal governor, and you will have ended this conflict. And again, the main event, Missouri, uh, in, at the Battle of First Manassas, okay? Now, Confederates, they're eager for battle too. They think that the North, once they have lost a single battle, will come to their senses and quit. And people's contest angle. Secretary of War says, of the Confederacy's confidence says we can't be beaten. And note the language here. There is no instance of a country like ours losing, if true to themselves, meaning it all rests on the consent of the governed. If we are true to ourselves, true to the Confederate cause, we will prevail. We've got too much space, too much that we cannot be beaten by the North. And the fact that the North would even try to fight us in this situation shows that they really don't know what they're doing. But if we give them a good slap and around, That'll wake them up in a single battle, and they'll back off and let us be independent. At least that's the assumption a lot of Confederates carry into this battle. Of course, we all know that there's this thing here, the balance sheet. What's the old saying? The armadillo? Super determined animal, isn't it? Right? A lot of determination. Boy, the, the armadillo is true itself. When it's expressing that determination, and it walks out into the highway, right? And its determination is all there, but then the 18-wheeler comes along, and determination doesn't, is, doesn't, it just, just got him in a lot of trouble, right? Now, there is somebody who tries to impress this upon the people of the South. He is the superintendent of the Louisiana Military Academy. And he says to his, he says to his local people, the North can do all these things. He concedes, you've got determination. Yes, your secretary of war is right. You've got some determination. But we got a lot of stuff. The fact that you guys can't figure this out indicates there's something wrong with you Southerners. And therefore, a single battle will bring you to that realization, and that will end the conflict. The only people would stop and think, you'd see you must fail. 
Anybody know who was superintendent of Louisiana Military Academy then? William Tecumseh Sherman, right? He's going to come back in 1864, and he's going to visit Atlanta, right? And he's going to make clear to them, hey, this is what happens when you don't listen to me. William Tecumseh Sherman's first battle experience, the Battle of First Manassas. Okay, he's going to serve at that battle. Again, back to that Jomanian first step of planning. Agree with the head of state on the nature of the conflict. Abraham Lincoln has a, his main military advisor is Winfield Scott, the commanding general of the army. He's been around a long time, 75 years old, and he's lived well because he's gotten up to 300 pounds to the point where he can't ride a horse without being winched onto it, and then oftentimes the horse tries to throw them, and there's often some debate who, got the, who usually gets the worst of the exchange when Scott and the horse are trying to uh, work things out. Scott presents a plan, what he calls the Anaconda Plan. Scott believes the rebellion is much more formidable than Lincoln does. Scott is also concerned that the use of force will be counterproductive in this conflict. If you go out and fight a battle with Southerners, you will be challenging their honor. And even if you defeat them in a single battle, their honor will lead them to continue fighting on. Whereas if you rely more on what we call the modern equivalent of economic sanctions, a blockade of the South, squeeze them gently, like the Anaconda does. This is what comes known as the Anaconda Plan. Through economic sanctions, deny them luxuries by cutting them off from outside trade and commerce, and that will bring them back. But if you go out and fight a battle, they're going to fight back. And if you invade the South, even if you win, you'll probably be farther away from resolving the conflict than if you had not. Lincoln has a different perspective. Now, two key voices are whispering in Lincoln's ear during this time. One is Winfield Scott. The other are members of the Francis Blair family. which We've already seen Francis P. Blair Jr. out in Missouri, an advocate of, un the belief is among these people, is that the reason the South is acting the way it does it's engaged in a huge bluff. They're bullies. But if you stand up to them, sure. Scott is exactly wrong. By not challenging them, you will encourage an image of northern weakness and lack of resolution, which will not win back their hearts and minds, but it will only further the contempt of the southern people for the federal government. Now, Blair and Scott, their advice is shaped by history specifically the history of 1832 and 1833. In those years, the United States government, the state of South Carolina, did not like the tariff on imported goods. So they inst instigated something called the nullification crisis and said they would not obey the federal laws on the tariffs. Now, during this crisis, Andrew Jackson rattled the saver with conspicuous zeal encouraged by newspaper editorials published by the Washington Globe, which was edited by Francis P. Blair, Sr. And the crisis was resolved, and the Blairs believed the South backed down because Jackson made clear, Andrew Jackson made clear, his determination to enforce the law. And that if you take a wishy-washy, the reason the South has gotten to this point, because whenever they've complained, we've come, you know, like with kids, right? You know your kids, right? If, you know, if your kids you know, throw their temper tantrum in the, uh, in the store, what do you do? Buy them the candy? What thing happens the next time you go to the store? Another tantrum. But if you stand up right away, then they'll back down, and they'll learn that defiance does not pay. And if we give in to them again, we're going to be playing this game over and over. So we've got to make a strong stand. Winfield Scott? He was also involved in the 1832-33 crisis. He was the commander of federal forces in Charleston Harbor at the time, a pretty sensitive place in 1832-33. And what Scott had done was he had encouraged the men of his command to interact, to engage with the people of South Carolina, to assure them of the goodwill of the federal government. And he believed that had resolved the crisis. 
because he believed. You take a hard stand once the shooting starts. The most important thing is to not have the first shot fired. But once the shooting started, then everything will lose control. And so you've got these two men using lessons of history from this, separate lessons from the same episode in shaping their thinking on this issue. Now, when Scott is asked, how long do you think your anaconda will take? About two years at a minimum. Francis people, okay, Blair family, how long is yours going to take? Well, we got troops for 90 days. It'll be done by 90 days. Well, what decision do you think a president is going to choose, given a two-year uncertain and the argument for something that'll be quick, dirty, and get it done with quick? He goes with the Blair family's uh, suggestions, and he orders an advance on what's going to be the Confederate forces at Manassas Junction. The man chosen to command it, a man by the name of Irvin McDowell. McDowell, prior to the war, in 1861, was a major serving on the staff in Washington, D.C. He impressed people around the Capitol with his hard work organizing troops for defending the Capitol. And more importantly, McDowell is from the state of Ohio. And that's important because in the, normally the choice of, of commanders, you would expect the Secretary of War to play a key role in that. Well, Lincoln's first Secretary of War was a man by the name of Simon Cameron. Simon Cameron was appointed as a political favor, not because he had any competence or interest in the military, other than seeing how many contracts he could funnel to his friends in Pennsylvania. Uh, the story about Cameron was when he's finally relieved from the Secretary of War, Lincoln gives him an appointment to become ambassador to Russia, and one politician says, at the time, somebody better send a telegram to the czar, tell him Cameron's coming so he'll know to lock up his valuables at night. 